patient safety and use of anticoagulants in the hospital setting. So why this topic? I chose this topic because I work in a cardiac ICU where 90% of our patients are on anticoagulant therapy. This is typically heparin for STEMIs, non-STEMIs, and unstable angina. And if they're not on blood thinners for cardiac reasons, they're typically on blood thinners for VTE prophylaxis. So bleeding risk is high on my unit due to the prevalence and frequency with which we use anticoagulant therapy, and there just needs to be a more formal approach to assessing bleeding risk in these patients. One of the Joint Commission's National Patient Safety Goals, first introduced in 2008 and updated and revised in 2015, is to reduce the incidence of patient harm associated with the use of anticoagulant therapy. This typically translate, translates to the reduction or minimization of bleeding risks or bleeding events. The Joint Commission lists eight elements of performance aimed at reducing the incidence of harm related to anticoagulants. These include using only unit dose syringes and premixed vials or premixed infusions, using approved hospital protocols for the maintenance, initiation, maintenance, and management of anticoagulation therapy, assessing a patient's baseline coagulation status before starting warfarin and really any anticoagulant for that matter, Use of authoritative resources to assess food and drug interactions for patients receiving warfarin. Using only programmable, programmable pumps when administering IV heparin. Referring to a written policy um, when trying to figure out when to obtain lab work and what lab work to obtain. Providing education to both providers and patients and their families. And lastly, routinely evaluating anticoagulant safety practices and taking appropriate actions in a given time frame when um, actions are needed. So in my paper, I looked at, I explored three of the big name anticoagulants, heparin, low molecular weight heparin, or Lovenox, and warfarin. Heparin is typically indicated in VTE prophylaxis and atrial fibrillation, as well as in acute MIs, unstable angina, and use during cardiac surgeries, dialysis, and extracorporeal circulation. It can be administered subcutaneously or intravenously. It works by binding to antithrombin-3, which is in the body, and this, the complex of heparin and antithrombin-3 then in, inactivates coagulation enzymes, namely thrombin and factor 10A. Potential adverse effects include heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, which is a significant decrease in platelet count, or greater than 50% decrease, 50 decrease in platelet count, um, and hemorrhagic events, or bleeds. Safe management of heparin is multifactorial. First and foremost, you always want to assess for bleeding risk and monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding. You also want to monitor the patient's PTT or anti-10A every six hours while on continuous heparin infusions. Monitoring of the ACT or activated clotting time may be indicated if large amounts of heparin are administered, as in cardiac procedures. You always want to observe for the onset of HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and again, this is noted by a significant or greater than 50% drop in the patient's platelet count, leading to thrombosis in 50% of affected patients. It's always important to remember that you have protamine sulfate that can be administered as a reversal agent. Moving on to low molecular weight heparin, or Lovenox, it's primarily indicated in VTE prophylaxis and treatment, but it sometimes is used in acute coronary syndrome. It is always administered subcutaneously in the lower abdominal quadrants. And like heparin, it binds to antithrombin 3, and inhibit, but it inhibits thrombin to a lesser degree and antifactor 10A to a, to a greater degree. Its potential adverse effect is hemorrhagic events or bleeds, but it's important to remember that it too um, can cause heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Safe management of low molecular weight heparin. So as always with any anticoagulant, you want to assess for bleeding risk and monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding. You always want to be cognizant of renal function with low molecular weight heparin. It takes 12 hours for your kidneys to completely eliminate low molecular weight heparin. So if you have any sign of renal impairment, you may want to advise the physician to renally, renally dose or not use Lovenox at all. Around the clock lab monitoring while on low molecular weight heparin is not typically indicated, um, but it may be necessitated in the case of renal impairment, pregnancy, or body weight extremes. Like I said, you always want, want to monitor for HIT. It's unlikely, but still possible. And protamine sulfate is also approved for the use and reversal of low molecular weight heparin. Over to the side, I found this picture on the internet. It's a large hematoma that's resulted um, from use of low molecular weight heparin. There are many benefits of low molecular weight heparin over heparin. I thought they were worth noting. One, increased bioavailability. 
two, ease of administration, three, better absorbed, four, it remains in the bloodstream longer, so that means less frequent dosing or Q12 hour dosing, predictable anticoagulation, and that is absolutely key, no need, generally no need for around-the-clock lab monitoring, and significantly less risk for HIT. Moving on to warfarin, warfarin for like the last half a century has been the gold standard for oral anticoagulation. Um, it has many challenges and limit, limitations associated with it, so it's kind of being phased out in favor of these new oral anticoagulants, which I'll mention later. Um, but warfarin still is on the market, and we still, we still use it, we still discharge patients home on it, so it's worth mentioning. Its primary indications are prophylaxis and treatment of VTE, particularly in association with AFib, stroke, clotting disorders, and heart valve replacements. It is administered orally. It is a vitamin K antagonist. Um, like I said, it has many challenges and limitations, which is why it's being phased out, but they include a narrow therapeutic index, multiple food and drug interactions, and need for frequent lab monitoring and subsequent redosing. Potential adverse effects always, always, always are bleeds. Safe management of warfarin. There are three, three big things. One, you always want to assess your bleeding risk and monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding. Two, routine monitoring of INR as often as twice a week or as infrequent as once a month. And three, patient education is a big issue with warfarin, particularly when it um, comes to food and drug interactions. You always want to teach patients to avoid excessive intake of foods and drinks high in vitamin K, like spinach, cereals, other leafy greens, green teas, shards. You also want to have patients minimize intake or completely abstain from things like cranberry juice and alcohol. Down in the left um, lower corner, you'll see a five centimeter, five centimeter hemorrhage, um, intracranial hemorrhage from a patient on warfarin. I'm not sure what precipitated this event, if they fell or if it was spontaneous, but nonetheless, um, you really want to monitor for bleeds. And as I mentioned, or Warfarin is being phased out in favor of these new oral anticoagulants. The three big ones that are on the market are Pradaxa, Xarelto, and Eliquis. Signs and symptoms of bleeding, I'm sure we're all aware, but just to go through them, an acute drop in H&H, &H, nosebleeds or epistaxis, blood and sputum or hemoptysis, gum bleeding, hematuria, melana, hematemesis, unusual bruising, or excessive bleeding from a surgical site. So over and over and over again, we hear that it's important to assess for bleeding risk. Well, as I was doing my research, I wanted to know if there were any formal bleeding risk tools out on the market, and there are, but they've all been developed for patients on warfarin. It's, so it's kind of unclear whether these tools can be used for patients on other anticoagulants, but nonetheless, I thought they were um, worth mentioning. Examples of these tools to assess bleeding risk include the Modified Outpatient Bleeding Risk Index, the RIT Risk Scheme, and the HASBLED. One thing I found interesting is that there are common risk factors um, for anticoagulant-related hemorrhage um, used in every single assessment tool, and they include advanced age, typically greater than 60 or 65, hypertension, high falls risk, prior stroke, prior GI bleed or known peptic ulcer disease, renal impairment, liver disease, diabetes, anemia, or prior hemorrhage. One thing I also found in my research is that there's a high incidence of medication er errors associated with anticoagulation therapy. 7%, according to one study, 7% of all in inpatient medication errors involve anticoagulants, resulting in a 20% increased risk of death. These errors typically are from overdosing, underdosing, improper use or noncompliance with standardized protocols, or failure to obtain and react to lab results. So the National Institute of Health published some guidelines necessary for the safe delivery of anticoagulation therapy. They include process, using a standardized process for the initiation, maintenance, management, and discontinuation of anticoagulation therapy, anti-accountability, which kind of refers to the need for a leadership team that is accountable and responsible for um, managing policies and procedures, integration, meaning um, all the policies and procedures need to be hardwired and not um, just delivered by voice, Standards of practice, there need to be standards of practice for initiation, maintenance, um, and discontinuation of anticoagulation therapy, provider education and competency. Providers all, um, always need to be educated and their competency needs to be checked on a routine basis. Patients need to be educated 
um, what they're receiving, why they're receiving it, and potential risk factors or adverse events that um, could happen uh, based on their therapy. Care transitions, meaning there needs to be appropriate follow-up and communication upon discharge. Um, and eight outcomes. Safety outcomes need to be routinely addressed and action plans to need to be put in place um, in response to those outcomes. So we were told to find a change model or a change therapy theory and apply it to an action plan. So the theory I chose was Kurt Lewin's change theory. It's three steps, unfreeze, change, and refreeze. Unfreeze, with the first step, unfreeze, you want to make sure the environment is ready for change. You want to ripen it for change. Make sure that you have support and blessing of upper management. Make sure that there is actually a verified need for change. And three, you want to just manage doubts and, ex doubts and concerns. Um, two is actually change when you execute the desired change. That's pretty self-explanatory. And three, the refreeze step, you want to ensure the longevity and survival of the desired change. You're essentially making it a standard operating procedure. So Kurt Lewin's theory applied to the topic of bleeding risk while in anticoagulation. Um, I chose, um, let me back up a little bit. So my action plan was to create my own unnamed bleeding risk assessment tool that can be used on my unit. Um, the idea was that this tool would mimic the way that the fall risk assessment tools like the Morse and the skin risk assessment tools like the Braden work. So nurses were to fill out the assessment tools on each patient receiving anticoagulation therapy every shift. Documentation was on paper. Um, however, ideally, the assessment tool would be approved for integration into the electronic health record, EPIC in my case. So this tool was intended to increase the nurse's awareness of bleeding risk and associated risk factors and to promote individualized patient education based on those um, bleeding risk scores. So moving, going backwards a little bit, application to Kurt Lewin's theory. Um, first, I needed to unfreeze. I need the need for bleeding. The bleeding risk tool was verified by my coworkers. The support was obtained by my team leader and nurse manager, and all questions, questions and concerns from my peers were answered. Two was change. Education was provided to the RNs on how to use and understand the assessment tool. And then the bleeding risk assessment tool was officially launched and used on a shift to shift basis. So that bleeding risk assess assessment tool looks like this. Um, first, I had them answer, is the patient in anticoagulation therapy? If yes, proceed. And then step two, you actually assigned one point to each of the following risk factors for anticoagulation, anticoagulant-associated hemorrhage or bleeding events. Um, and then you were to sum all the points at the end to calculate a total bleeding risk score. The risk factors I use um, that place a patient at heightened risk for bleeding events include age greater than 65, high falls risk, hypertension, GI bleed or prior history of peptic ulcer disease, prior stroke, liver disease, renal impairment, diabetes, or prior bleeding event. So the higher the score, the greater the bleeding risk. However, I made sure that the nurses knew that no matter what the score, even if it was zero, all patients on anticoagulation therapy are at risk for bleeding. And thus, the RN should still monitor, uh, still, still maintain strict bleeding precautions and monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding. And like I said, what's the point? The point is that is to make the RN more aware of risk factors that would increase the incidence of an anticoagulation-associated bleeding event and to promote individualized patient education based on those scores. Evaluation. So the idea of using a bleeding risk assessment tool was generally well received. The most common complaint from my peers is, you know, we already have so much else to document on. We already spend so much time in front of the computer. Um, why do we need one more thing uh, to document? The major limitation was time. I only had one week to trial my assessment tool after getting everything ready. Um, but generally, I found that use of Kurt Lewin's change theory helped simplify and organize the change process, and I'd be willing to use his change theory change theory um, um, in, further, in, in future action plans um, because I really appreciated the way it focused so much on readying an environment for change as opposed to just jumping um, to the you know, desired intervention. So that kind of sums up my topic. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I, looked, I really enjoyed working with you all.